Hello and welcome to this afternoon session with the Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. We're going to be talking uh, with a number of members for, for several hours this afternoon on some very interesting topics. Uh, Plant-Based Health Professionals have played a, a very, very valuable role in the uh, online shows we've been doing this last year, uh, but on a bigger picture, uh, the contribution over the last few years to the growth of understanding of plant-based diets, uh, which is obviously a huge component of being vegan, um, is just been outstanding. And as I've grown a little bit older, my hair's got a little bit grayer, I've come to appreciate more and more the value of research, science, academia, and the kindness and supportiveness and the generosity uh, displayed by um, so many experts that now go out to make the part of self professionals. Uh, so it really is a sense of gratitude um, which I want to convey to all the members um, who have participated, will continue to participate and will continue to grow and join over the years to come. So thank you. And on that note, we should like to welcome warmly Dr. Shireen Kassam and Dr. Leila Duggan, who are the hosts today for this really, really interesting lineup and some very specialised topics here. Uh, Shireen, Leila, uh, thank you again. Welcome, and, and again, you know, my my gratitude for for such a such a lot of information that we've been able to share. Of course, it's the resource that's available. Share all over the world, whenever you want, freely. And, um, I shall hand over to you both uh, to, to, to introduce all these fabulous participants. Uh, Shereen, Leila, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for having us. It's always so exciting to host actually these health talks and, you know, share how uh, we can improve our health on a vegan diet. And I'm really excited today because we have two topics we haven't covered before. So we are going to talk about the raw vegan diet and skin issues. So that's really exciting and interesting. So, but it's, it's towards the end. So you need to join us towards the end as well. And, you know, all these speakers are actually members of the Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. And we are really lucky to have experts among our members. And, you know, membership is actually open to everybody, even to the, uh, you know, people who are not healthcare professionals. So you can join us. And we have a private Facebook group and we host regular social, uh, social events. We even had a yoga session once and we have cook-alongs. So, you know, there are some advantages of becoming a member. Plus, you, are, you will support our work. So, you know, feel free to join us, visit our website, and there is a link how to join us. And I guess many of you know Dr. Shirin Kassam. She's the founder of Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. And, you know, Shirin, do you want to tell us what is news, what is happening? Yeah, thank you, Leila, and thank you, Tim. A great pleasure to be back again. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess overall lockdown and the pandemic has kind of been kind to us in a way because it's given us a time to expand our work and make it more accessible online. So as you know, Leila, we, our membership has grown exponentially. You know, we're over 700 members, two thirds of whom are health professionals and all contributing in their own way by supporting our work, but also actively contributing to things that we are doing. And some of those things that have been really useful this year are a growing number of fact sheets, um, which are free downloads for anyone to use for themselves or with their patients and clients. And thank you, Leila, for leading on that with Kate Dunbar, who does the most excellent designs and makes them accessible to everybody. Um, you, Leila, have brought to us a free 21-day plant-based health challenge, um, which is essentially a free sign up on the website where you're supported for 21 days with emails and videos and um, really useful information about how to adopt a healthy vegan diet, which is what we're all about doing it to promote our health as a way of promoting veganism as well. Um, as I say, our online presence has increased um, and we're particularly wanting to educate health professionals um, to help demystify some of these prevailing myths. And our webinar programme, which launched almost a year ago, um, has been going every fortnight, free live videos, um, sorry, webinars, 
run by Rahiba Jekyll, supported by um, ProVeg and VeganFitness.com. And they've been hugely um, uh, important to our work with over 300 people joining in each um, webinar. And then, of course, Leila, you and I have been um, working together with our latest project, which is the launch of Plant Based Health Online, which is the UK's first online lifestyle medicine service that's also using plant based nutrition to support patients and clients to adopt a healthier lifestyle, whatever their um, underlying diet pattern or health condition, just to support people to make healthier choices. And we're CQC accredited and we are steaming forward with um, that. So do check that out, plantbasedhealthonline.com and you'll meet some of the practitioners, including Leila, Sonia and Jenny later on. So thank you. And um, I'm really looking forward to an uh, education packed afternoon. Thank you. Yes, it is uh, a lot is actually happening, which is exciting, I have to say. And so I think we should just really get started. It is almost 10 past uh, two. Thank you, Shireen. So our first speaker is Karine. She is a registered nutritional therapist and she specializes in women's health and plant-based nutrition. And uh, her main focus is actually perimenopause. And she thinks that we don't talk enough about it. And that is why she's going to present today. Karine, do you want to join us? Where is she? Oh, here she is. Hi, Karine. Can you hear me? Yes, all good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So first, thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, a topic that I think is you know, very important that maybe talked enough about. So today I would like to talk about um, how we can support our hormones during uh, perimenopause using the plant-based approach. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so what is perimenopause? So Perimenopause is part of a woman's transition into menopause. So a lot of symptoms that we associate with the menopause can uh, become an issue much earlier than we would expect. So typically, um, um, when women are in their 40s, so it can be quite confusing for women because as they think they're still too young and their menstrual cycle uh, may still look normal, so at least in the early days. Um, as for menopause, it's uh, the point when... Um, a woman uh, no longer has menstrual periods, so for at least 12 months. So in the UK, the average age of uh, menopause is uh, 51. So of course, a lot of women will sail through this transition with no symptoms. Um, however, for a lot of women, it's not a symptom-free transition. So here are some of the symptoms uh, women can experience in their 40s onwards, so due to hormonal fluctuations. So just a few statistics, around 25% of women will experience severe symptoms. 40% of women uh, suffer from low mood or depression. 70% uh, of women uh, will experience hot flushes at some point. So what happens during perimenopause? So let's uh, have a quick look at some of the key hormones and see what happens during the perimenopause. So the production of female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone in the ovaries starts to decline from around the age of 35. So basically the egg reserve begins to run out. Oestrogen regulates the menstrual cycle, protects the bones, heart, brain, joints, and muscle mass. It maintains vaginal blood flow and lubrication. Progesterone helps prevent the uterine lining from getting too thick. So low levels um, can result in heavy periods, menstrual syndrome. So progesterone is also uh, considered the calming, soothing hormone. So it helps us with sleep. Uh, so during uh, perimenopause, so progesterone declines faster than estrogen, so which can result in an imbalance. Estrogen can fluctuate a lot during perimenopause, so sometimes it's high, another time it's lower. Testosterone, which is needed for libido, motivation, energy, muscle strength, also declines when we are in our 40s. 
Um, yeah, sorry, and the ad adrenal glands, so the glands uh, on top of each kidney are still able to produce some sex hormones. So, um, sorry, I should go back to my former slide. Um, so they also produce uh, our stress hormone cortisol and adrenaline. Uh, so more than ever during perimenopause, it's a very important time to support the adrenal glands by uh, trying to manage stress. So which is, you know, actually not very easy when women have a lot to juggle. It's also very important to keep insulin in check by eating a diet that helps maintain blood sugar balance. So symptoms of uh, blood sugar imbalance include fatigue, cravings for sugar or carbs, mood swings, low mood, PMS, insomnia, irritability, anxiety, headaches, dizziness, weight gain, palpitations. So we, if we have high levels of stress hormones and high blood sugar, this can be double trouble. So balancing these hormones is essential for a smoother transition. So if we support insulin and cortisol, it's going to support estrogen and progesterone, and it's also going to support our thyroid. So diet and lifestyle can play a key role in supporting a healthy transition. And the earlier a woman starts looking after her diet and lifestyle, uh, the, the easier it will be. Um, which is why I think uh, women should not wait until they are in, into their uh, 40s or 50s. So being aware of upcoming hormone changes can be really empowering and will equip women with the knowledge to best support their health as they head towards their 40s and 50s. So good nutrition and hydration are key when it comes to balancing hormones. So we need the right amount of protein to produce and transport hormones. Um, we need vitamins and minerals to help metabolize and break down hormones. Um, they also need healthy fats, slow-release carbohydrates, antioxidants, and phytonutrients. They also need, um, and of course, fiber and water to help them move around and detoxify. Um, so women who follow a plant-based diet are more likely to experience less symptoms. So a cross-sectional study found that perimenopausal women who followed a vegan diet reported less bothersome uh, vasomotor symptoms than women who ate an omnivore diet, so symptoms such as um, hot flushes, for instance. Um, so first, we'll want to avoid processed or packaged foods, so all these foods that are made in um, factories, so uh, such as ready-made meals and other foods that we've typically find in the middle lives of the supermarket. So these foods have been altered to increase their shelf life. And often they are calorie rich, but nutrient poor. So meaning they don't contain enough quality vitamins and minerals needed to support our hormones. So, and of course they are also uh, low in fiber. Um, so let's have a quick look at uh, our macronutrients. So we'll want to avoid our intake in refined carbohydrates, such as sugar sweetened beverages, fruit juices, pastries, white bread, white rice, white pasta, etc., because they raise insulin and cortisol, and they are, of course, uh, nutrient poor. So instead, we'll want to focus on what we call slow-release sugars or carbohydrates, such as brown rice, wholemeal bread, whole wheat pasta, oats, quinoa, buckwheat, beans, legumes, fruits and uh, vegetables. So focusing on these types of less refined carbohydrates helps minimize uh, major blood sugar spikes and dips. So for instance, uh, carbohydrate, uh, sorry, vegetables are carbohydrates, but uh, the fiber found in vegetables helps slow down the, the absorption of carbohydrates. So these carbohydrates help sustain energy. Um, so protein can uh, be found mainly in beans and lentils, nuts and seeds, quinoa, soy products such as tempeh, tofu. So good quality plant-based protein can help slow the release of sugar into the blood, increase our satiety hormones, uh, boost our metabolism, help maintain healthy bones and muscles. And, and as I'm sure you know, as we age, we tend to lose muscle mass. Uh, it's also key for our detoxification process and for our brain function. Uh, actually, the worst time to have a blood sugar spike is in the morning. Therefore, a protein-rich breakfast is a good idea. So, for instance, you know, tofu uh, scramble or adding flax seeds and soy milk to porridge, etc. So, here are a few um, uh, examples of protein-rich foods. I'll let you have a look. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so there are fats you will want to avoid, such as fats found in foods like vegetable oils and oils such as sunflower oil, canola, corn, grapeseed oil. So they easily go rancid and they, all these oils promote uh, inflammation. Um, you will want to avoid ready meals, takeaways and fast foods, margarine uh, and spreads, crisps and chips, um, shop bought cookies, pastries, um, biscuits, cakes, sauces and salad dressings, etc. And instead, we want to focus on, you know, more nourishing fats such as fats coming from nuts and seeds, avocados, olives. There is a, uh, a type of essential fats, so omega-3 fats, provide anti-inflammatory benefits. So they play a very important role in optimizing brain function. Uh, in perimenopause, uh, they can help reduce hot flushes. So they can help with the skin dryness and reduce inflammation in the body. Uh, they also help balance the effects of stress by decreasing the release of cortisol. So flax seeds, walnuts, chia seeds, hemp seeds, so they contain an omega-3 fatty acid called ALA, so alpha linolenic acid. Um, however, our body needs to convert ALA into the more useful EPA and DHA. And the conversion rate is quite low and inconsistent, so which is why I tend to recommend an algae supplement with the essential fatty acids EPA and DHA. So I'm sure you're already very familiar with the gut microbiome. It's all about the gut microbiome these days, isn't it? <laughs> um, so here is a good definition by uh, Professor Tim Spector. So Tim Spector is a professor of genetic epidemiology who has been involved in the microbiome research. As you know, during perimenopause, so estrogen levels fluctuate. So we now know that the gut plays an essential hormonal function. There's actually a subset of bacteria known as the extrobolum, which is responsible for metabolizing estrogens and keeping estrogen levels in check. So how do we support our gut microbiome? Um, so Dr. B, as he likes to be called, um, is a plant-based American gastroenterologist and the author of Fiber Fuel. So he says, the single greatest predictor of a healthy gut microbiome is the diversity of plants in one's diet. So based on the latest research literature, so the best way we can support our gut, um, a healthy gut microbiome is by consuming a diversity of whole plant foods. So diversity is key, and we should aim at around 30 different plant foods a week. So plant foods are high in fiber, which is the best fuel for the gut bacteria. Uh, this explains why a diverse plant-based diet uh, that includes a variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices is so beneficial for gut health. Fiber also helps us um, feel full and it slows down the absorption of sugar. Um, also, we really need to keep our bowels moving as we don't want uh, toxic waste to build up and our estrogen to be recycled. So by eating the rainbow, we also get a variety of vitamins, minerals and phytonutrients. You might agree with me, but I think humans are creatures of habits. Um, as a nutritionist, when I look at food diaries, uh, I notice that people tend to have the same breakfast or lunch almost every day. So. I mean, it could be, it could actually be a very healthy meal, but um, it's really actually really important to rotate foods to provide more diversity. So for instance, instead of having, uh, instead of always making hummus with chickpeas, why not try hummus with butter beans or cannelli beans? So these little, you know, these little swaps, uh, they can really help increase the diversity in our diet. So now I would like to focus on a few specific plant foods and plant compounds that have been shown to be particularly ben uh, beneficial during perimenopausal years. So cruciferous uh, vegetables, uh, such as cauliflower, broccoli, broccoli sprouts, uh, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, watercress, rocket, they contain a great fatonutrient called sulforaphane. 
Sulforaphane has been shown to provide quite a lot of health benefits. So it supports um, the liver detoxification pathways, which are key to metabolizing estrogens. And of course, uh, cruciferous vegetables are a very good source of fiber. So I tend to recommend to consume at least two daily portions of crucif cruciferous uh, vegetables. And of course, phytoestrogens. So phytoestrogens are not estrogens. They are phytonutrients, so plant compounds that bind to estrogen receptors in the body. So during perimenopause, they help promote healthy estrogen met metabolism. So some studies suggest that they can help relieve hot flushes, night sweats, and anxiety. It's likely that the high level of phytoestrogens found in soy on a predominantly plant-based diet may explain why um, women in Asian cultures experience a lower incidence in hot flushes. So the two main classes are isoflavones and lignans. Uh, for instance, isoflavones found in soybeans, tempeh, natto, miso, tofu, edamame. Uh, perimenopausal women who experience low mood and mood swings. Uh, in interestingly, um, some studies suggest that soybeans, um, soybean isoflavones uh, may have an antidepressant effect. Lignans, so flax seeds, sesame seeds, pulses such as chickpeas, beans, lentils, uh, broccoli, and fennel. So flax seeds are really great. So they are a good source of phytoestrogen, uh, protein. They also contain the omega-3 fatty acid, ALA. And they are also very high in fiber. So a couple of tablespoons a day is, uh, I believe, a great addition to the diet, especially during perimenopausal years. It can be added to water, to a smoothie, or sprinkled uh, on top of a salad. Um, it's best not to buy the pre-ground flax seeds because of uh, oxidation, so freshly ground is, is best, if possible. As you may already know, uh, water makes up around 80% uh, of our brain. So if we are dehydrated, it affects uh, our stress hormones by increasing cortisol levels. So water is also um, important for digestion and detoxification and for brain uh, health and cognition. Let's talk about coffee a bit. So, of course, a good quality coffee does have, you know, lots of health benefits. You know, it's high in anti-inflammatory polyphenols, it can protect the, it can protect the liver, etc. However, um, our tolerance to caffeine really depends on our genetic ability to metabolize it. And if women uh, during perimenopause feel anxious, have palpitations or trouble sleeping after consuming caffeine, there are actually quite a lot of alternative options available. I really like dandelion root coffee. So it's a great caffeine-free uh, alternative to coffee. You can try turmeric latte, um, organic decaf green tea, Tulsi tea, also called um, holy basil tea. So it has adaptogenic properties and it helps reduce stress and cortisol levels. Chamomile tea is great. It can help with cramping during menstruation and it has, as I'm sure you know, calming properties. And it's also very good for digestion. I also love ginger tea. I find that it really helps uh, women who suffer from um, menstrual cramps. Sage tea is known for helping with hot flashes. Valerian and lemon balm uh, also have calming properties. I really love nettle tea because it helps uh, nourish the adrenals and it has cleansing properties. It's also a good source of iron and I believe vitamin C. Um, and it can also help reduce premenstrual bloating. So lots of choice. I don't know if you've noticed, but as we get older, we are less able to cope with alcohol. So sorry, I don't mean to be a, a killjoy here, but alcohol can really be a big trigger for some of the symptoms of perimenopause. Um, it disrupts blood sugar balance and it can trigger hot flushes, night sweats, sleep, disruption, sleep uh, disruptions later in the night. It irritates the lining of the gut. It impairs with the liver's ability to process and get rid of all estrogen. It depletes nutrients, especially our B vitamins, which are needed to balance our hormones. I mean, of course, a small amount of alcohol is not that bad, but I think it will also depend uh, a lot on uh, lifestyle and family history. 
So here is a quick summary of um, a little summary of the key points. So avoid sugar, refined carbohydrates and processed foods, enough protein. Remember to fill half the plate with colorful vegetables, so eat the rainbow. Uh, rotate plant foods, so it's important to remember that diversity is key. So consume omega-3s, um, ideally two portions of cruciferous vegetables a day. Uh, consume fast to estrogens. A good hydration is very important and try trying to limit or avoiding uh, stimulants. Um, we haven't, uh, we don't have time today to cover uh, lifestyle, but as a nutritional therapist, um, I also look at lifestyle to support hormone health. So I think trying to spend time in nature is very important, even if it's just like 20 minutes in the morning, uh, a bit of sunlight exposure in the morning is known to help um, reset circadian rhythms as well. Uh, exercise, yoga, or Pilates is great. Um, it's important to try to limit our exposure to xenoestrogens, so all these environmental toxins that mimic um, hormones. Um, stress management, such as mindfulness, deep breathing, prioritizing self-care, a, a very good sleep routine. Um, and sometimes yeah, people can consider complementary therapies, such as reflexology um, or acupuncture. So hopefully I was able to uh, give you a quick snapshot, so just a snapshot of how nutritious, diverse, uh, di how a nutritious, um, diverse plant-based diet can help support women during this natural transition. So by feeding um, hormones the right nutrients, women can find relief from their symptoms. I mean, of course, um, every woman is unique and depending on circumstances, um, hormones therapy may be necessary for some, but I think it's really good to remember that nothing works in isolation and whatever the circumstances, good nutrition really plays a, a significant role. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Corinne. That was really interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, I find it quite interesting that, you know, obviously we are here to advocate and promote a whole food plant-based diet. And, you know, if we follow that, it helps with the symptoms, doesn't it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, we don't have any, uh, nobody has asked any uh, questions, but I do have questions. So if you don't <laughs> mind, I'm going to ask you. So what are some of the common symptoms you see in early perimenopause, you know, you see in your clients or just in general? So I, I think based on my personal experience, I'm in my mid forties myself, um, based on my experience working with women and talking to my friends, it's actually, um, I would say emotional changes uh, to start with, like mood swings, um, increased anxiety is quite common, um, but also, of course, you know, uh, changes in menstrual cycles, like um, heavier periods or irregular periods. Uh, some women tend to suffer more from um, PMS symptoms. Um, actually, brain fog as well is often reported. Um, Sometimes women, they, they think that <laughs> they don't know what's going on with me. Like I keep forgetting everything. So I wouldn't say it's like, it wouldn't typically start with hot flushes, uh, but more like, I would say, yeah, more these emotional symptoms and changes around uh, menstrual cycles. Yeah. What, uh, what about you? Have you, I mean, not about you, but no. <laughs> <laughs> you look young. <laughs> um, what about working with women in uh, their that is, Yeah, that is not a specialty I uh, cover, actually. So, you yeah. know, and we have actually other people in our team, you know, uh, plant-based yeah. health online who deal with that. But, you know, I'm just wondering, why do some women actually suffer, uh, have stronger symptoms than the others? Do you know any reason? Is there, you know, is there something, is, is there something known? Yes, I'm looking to that because I was quite intrigued as well. So um, I think it's, it's going to be a combination of things like uh, definitely genetics, um, especially if women have, a, you know, a low naturally like a genetic predisposition to have a very low resilience to stress. I think, you know, it's um, 
um, it can be a big factor. Um, also, I think the woman's uh, general state of health at the time of perimenopause, so that's where uh, diet and lifestyle, you know, could be very useful. Uh, because as we say, um, what's this expression? Uh, genetics, genetics load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah, so <laughs> you're right. Exactly. So we can have the genetic predisposition for something, but we can do so much with our, the way we eat and the way we live our life, you know, can make a big difference. Um, I think also um, women who had uh, difficult um, periods before perimenopause tend to be more affected as well. So maybe women with conditions like maybe on the endometriosis, for instance, they may have a tougher time. Um, but yeah, luckily, as we've discussed, um, you know, there are lots of solutions for women uh, to feel better. And, and is there an age where, you know, you would actually recommend people to start with these lifestyle changes? There is a question from Sophie. She says, you know, she's just 25. Should she actually start doing something about that? Oh, that's excellent. I think, to be honest, the younger, the better. And um, because it can only make things smoother if you already have uh, the lifestyle and the diet into place by the time you get into your mid-30s. Um, <laughs> I have a cat, it's not my dog, it's, I don't have a dog, so. <laughs> um, yes, yes. And, uh, if she follows that, that would help her with her cycles as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think especially if you, if she already has like, um, you know, difficult menstrual cycles, I think like really optimizing diet and lifestyle from a very early age is, is a very, very good starting point, like, um, Definitely, uh, you know, um, nourishing whole food plant-based diets as we, uh, you know, I, I know I couldn't cover everything in, in such a short amount of time, but I hope I was able to demonstrate that uh, having a diversity of plant foods um, is going to help in many ways. Um, and of course, lifestyle, like having a very good sleep routine is very important uh, because, as you know, the body goes through a lot of repairs during the night. So um, we want to make sure we give our body this opportunity to, you know, deal with all these repairs. Um, yeah, we have we have two more questions, if you don't mind. Uh, Somebody is asking. Chantelle is asking, should we actually increase our uh, calcium consumption before and you know than during perimenopause? Um, I mean, uh, as we know that after um, postmenopausal women are more likely to have. Um, issue with osteopenia or osteoporosis um i think that's do, do they mean like from the diet not supplementation i would imagine yes um, i would imagine that as well because supplementation should really be you know yeah. and prescribed by a doctor so that is something exactly, that you yeah. should actually mention that you know calcium if you, it's better to take it you know from your food and if you feel like you may yeah. need you know, supplementation it should really be done via your doctor yeah. And we, we often think that uh, when it comes to bone health, we often think calcium, but actually vitamin D, magnesium, uh, what else? Vitamin, vitamin A. Yeah. So, exercise. Exercise. I uh, need to. Exercise, of course. Yes. Like, I mean, I know you are, you know, into exercise. So yes. muscle, um, how you say, um, weight bearing exercise is important as well to protect the bones. Um, but I, I think that a diverse uh, plant-based diet will should bring enough calcium into the diet. Uh, I think we have to be careful as well. Am I right with cal uh, calcium supp supplementation? We do have to be careful. Yes, yes. I don't usually recommend them unless there is really a medical reason for th uh, that. Just one last question. I heard of uh, seed cycling where you eat flax and pumpkin in follic uh, follicular phase and sesame and pumpkin in the luteal phase. Yes. What do you think of that? I have to say, I have to admit, I haven't tried, but it's quite popular. I think, especially in, I'm, 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 uh, with some American hormone experts. Um, um, yes, yeah, so basically, the first part of your cycle, you would focus on uh, some type of seeds and other type of seeds uh, during the second part of your cycle. Um, I did look at the research, and it was quite inconclusive. Uh, I did look into it. So, um, at the, uh, anecdotally, it seems to work, help some women. Um, but I don't think you will find like a research paper that 
Yeah, there is no evidence. And I think it's no about the no. fact that like kind of, you know, flaxseed, some people say it is uh, high in estrogen. So it is more yeah. like kind of, you know, I would suggest, you know, if you really follow a whole food plant based diet, exactly. and the more whole food it is, the less processed food you have, you will be fine. So it yeah, don't, you don't really need to kind of, yes. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that was really interesting. As I said, it is not uh, really a topic I usually you know, deal with, so I found it very interesting. And I hope that our audience also enjoyed it. And yes, that's it. Thank you very much. So thank you later. Happen. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, I just heard that our next speaker uh, is uh, going to be here in a few minutes, but I'm going to just introduce her anyway. Dr. Alpa Kumar, uh, Kumar, she's a portfolio GP and a lifestyle medicine specialist. She's also a health coach, and she has actually a, an interest, you know, in sexual health as well. And uh, she likes to work actually, you know, uh, combining her own personal experience and clinical experience, and as uh, how she used the whole food plant-based diet to help herself with rheumatoid arthritis. And that is actually going to be the topic of her talk today. So let me see if. Um, no, she's still not here. So let me see if you have any comments. Yeah, nothing, no comments. So, all right, so we'll just wait for her to join us. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, as I said, not just about the, you know, our next talk uh, about rheumatoid arthritis, anything else about the talks, obviously, uh, we are ha hosting today. Just make sure that you comment, post them in the chat box, and at some point I will get to them. And you can always message me as well, by the way. Okay. So I didn't really think, okay. So, um, okay, we still have to wait for Dr. Kumar. I think she has some connection, uh, you know, kind of uh, internet issues, which is very common. And you know, everybody's working from home, which doesn't make it easy. And as you heard, you know, from working from home has it, its advantages. And even, you know, doing these uh, live webinars, we can actually uh, reach more people, you know, people who are not necessarily in London. But then you can hear my dog barking, for example, in the background. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions, by all means, just uh, uh, write, and I'm happy to answer your questions about the vegan diet. I'm a nutritionist, just in case uh, somebody doesn't know that. Okay, if uh, the, uh, Karine is not here, maybe Jenny, if Jenny is available, maybe we can actually go and start with Jenny. Jenny Fernandez is a health coach. Uh, so let me see if she's available, then we can actually have that session now. Sorry about this, we didn't plan it well. Okay, so let me see, I think Karin is here. Karin, do you want to join us? And we can just have a chat. Uh, yes, here you are, okay. <laughs> So maybe we can just have a chat until Jenny or uh, Dr. Alpha Kumar can join us. Uh, I think you are mute. Are, are you mute? Uh, I think it's fine now. Okay, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, so just tell me a little bit about, you know, how did you get into nutrition? Um, I think like a lot of people, I, you know, my, I struggle with my own health. So um, I think that's, I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people who get into this field, um, especially the field of nutrition, I think they often have a story behind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was diagnosed with, you know, this umbrella term IBS. <laughs> um, then after I, when I became a mom, I felt like I really wanted to to learn everything about nutrition. I really, because in my family, so on both sides, there's, you know, a lot of issues like, uh, most of my grandparents died of cancer. Uh, my mom had cancer, uh, is a cancer survivor, so she had cancer twice. So I I really felt like I wanted to give the best start to my children. And because you don't have all the answers in books, yeah. <laughs> I just felt like, okay, it's time to go back studying. So when my, my um, son was a baby and my daughter was a toddler, I just, I enrolled into, uh, a nutrition course uh, for four years I studied nutrition and it, it was quite challenging but uh, it's been life-changing at the same time and yeah, yeah. yeah it is interesting like you said usually we get into it uh, because of a personal problem uh, you know health like, issue yeah. 
And it is the same with me, you know, I used to work as a doctor. And it is interesting, people assume that doctors know about nutrition. But looking back, I think, oh my God, I was so ignorant. I didn't know a single thing. And then, and I was, there I was, you know, feeling sick. I had chronic, you know, migraine, really suffering. And I actually had to quit medicine because of that. And then when I found out about, you know, food, that, you know, food is so powerful, I was like, kind of, how is that possible? How come that nobody told me about that? And, you know, and it is, uh, it is it's really sad because we can do so much. And that is, that was supposed actually to be one of the Dr. Kumar's talk was going to cover that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and there is also a lot of um, misinformation um, out there in the, you know, um, media and uh, which doesn't help. So I'm going to just, uh, there is a question. I'll just answer that. I think Dr. Kumar is here. Uh, what uh, supplement do I recommend? To be honest, I don't recommend any specific brand. I think, you know, do you, Karine? I just, uh, I think, you know, there are so many out there. Just find, you know, what whichever, you know, the, a cheap one, which you can afford. And there isn't really a huge difference between them, you know. So I don't really recommend any brands. No. I mean, then there are some specific supplements that we do recommend, like, you know, um, if you follow a uh, plant-based diet, um, yes. well, um, I think living in the UK, we all need a bit of extra vitamin D. <laughs> that is true. Um, all right, thank you, Karin. It was so lovely. Thank you for joining me again. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Thank you. It was lovely to chat with you. Here, no. Thank you again. Enjoy Have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye. So our next speaker is Dr. Alpha Kuma. Uh, I think I already actually introduced her, but I'm going to say it anyway, just uh, uh, in case you have just joined us now. She's a portfolio GP, a lifestyle medicine specialist, a health coach, and she has a, um, you know, a special interest in sexual health. And uh, she's going to talk about uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So, Alpa, are you here? I hope you are. Oh, yes, there she Hello, is. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me here. You're welcome. We are really lucky to have you here. So I think you have a presentation prepared for us, don't you? Yeah. Yes, I do indeed. I'm going to um, I'm mute now. myself and you go ahead. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Hello? Yes, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see it. Okay, wonderful. Well, that's one, keep it like that. Okay, great. Hello, good afternoon again, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, to be presenting this on behalf of Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. Um, and uh, the topic for my talk today is, can a plant-based diet and exercise reverse the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis? Let's find out. So going back to the basics, what is rheumatoid arthritis? You know, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. This basically means that your immune system which usually fights infection, it starts attacking the cells that line your joints by mistake. So what does that lead to? That leads to the joints being swollen, stiff, and painful. So um, let's look at the normal joint for a minute here. That's your bone, the cartilage, which is the stretchy, elastic-like connective tissue between the bones. And, the, and then you've got ligaments that the, which connect the bone to the cartilage. And then there's the synovial membrane, the fibrous sheet protecting it. And look at this picture of the joint in rheumatoid arthritis. So here there's you know, bone loss, the cartilage is eroded, the synovial membrane is thick. So in a sense, the joint doesn't look remotely like what it should normally. But I must warn you, this is not like the beginning of rheumatoid arthritis, we're looking at kind of end stage here, the picture, but that's that's the physiology behind what's happening in the joint. The cells, you know, your body cells are attacking your own body cells. So the joints are mainly affected and you classically see that the patient is complaining of morning stiffness, uh, which, is la which lasts usually more than half an hour in the morning. And they might also have other symptoms which might be related to organs like liver, heart, eyes, so it, it can be multi-systemic. And often, rheumatoid arthritis is also associated with other autoimmune conditions. Now, um, in the UK and worldwide, I'd say about 1% of the population suffers from rheumatoid arthritis, 
which is roughly about 400,000 people in the UK uh, suffer with, um, are diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis already. And um, the incidence is rising. So what are the risk factors for, for rheumatoid arthritis? We talk about genes. Again, I must emphasize the genes are not your destiny because according to studies, only one out of three people who carry the genes for rheumatoid arthritis end up having it. So what are the other factors? So it can be in your environment, the hormones working inside you, especially estrogen is related to rheumatoid arthritis. So we often find that women um, suffer more with rheumatoid arthritis than men. And, you know, the role of estrogen. And again, you know, estrogen is raised in obesity as well, which explains, you know, why there's an increased risk of having rheumatoid arthritis if you're obese. And again, one of the other known factors for rheumatoid arthritis is smoking. So that was kind of a brief outline of what rheumatoid arthritis is, without going into too much detail. Um, let's talk about nutrition, because that's the core of what we are discussing today. Now, this was a very good systemic review of um, the current knowledge of the effects of nutrition, diet, on um, the outcomes in rheumatoid arthritis. So when we talk about outcomes, we're looking at pain, you know, disability, fatigue, your day-to-day -day life. So this systemic review actually has made life much easier for us, um, you know, as uh, lifestyle medicine physicians and as doctors, because it, it just gives us an overview of 70 human studies that have been done on the role of diet and nutrition. So um, the essence of the study, what the conclusion was, that it is time to talk about nutrition. Right, so what have we learned from these studies? Four key takeaway points from the 70 studies that the systemic review uh, lays emphasis on. Point number one, fiber. Now, you know, what is the fuss about fiber? Fiber is the key component of diet which reduces joint inflammation here. We know from previous studies and knowledge that, you know, fiber forms the bulk of the diets are available only from plants and plant, you know, animal protein doesn't have any fiber. So fiber has a huge anti-inflammatory role, which might be implicated in reducing the incidence of autoimmune disease and also in preventing progression. Fiber has also has an important role in decreasing weight, which again, as we learned before, obesity can be a factor in you know, producing more estrogen in the body, which again is related with inflammation. So fiber is the key. The second thing that came out of these studies was omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids, as we've heard in the previous talk as well, they play a huge role in uh, you know, our brain health, the cardiovascular health, which is the heart health, and they reduce the symptoms of joint pain in rheumatoid arthritis. Thirdly, a plant-based diet, especially there have been numerous studies about vegan diet, which helps to, you know, which is central, which is key to reducing flare-ups and achieving a remission of symptoms. In one study out of these uh, we're talking about, just a three-week vegan lifestyle resulted in a 33% reduction in the inflammation marker levels. So this is really interesting. You know, this is what we could quote to when we go for a visit to a rheumatologist and say, what, what do you think about this? You know, this is the study um, that's come that a third of my symptoms uh, can be reduced, the inflammation markers can go down. And, you know, this is something we could talk to a general practitioners and also to family members, friends who suffer with autoimmune disease or who have a family history of autoimmune disease. So key things there to take away from that systemic review. And fourthly, vitamin D. We've all heard in the last year in the pandemic how important vitamin D is, you know, in preventing uh, severity of COVID. And no wonder, you know, it has been researched all this year, it also prevents the severity of autoimmune disease. In fact, one study even uh, mentioned that vitamin D can be the key in preventing the trigger that causes the cascade of autoimmune disease to happen in the first place. So you have four key points from those studies, increase fiber in your diet, incorporate omega-3 fatty acids, 
a plant-based diet, preferably a vegan diet and vitamin D. Uh, moving on from that study, there's another key study, which is the core study related to what I'm talking about today. So this was a review uh, which was published in 2019 about nutrition interventions in rheumatoid arthritis. So it basically, the key takeaway point from this is exclude animal products in your diet. So, you know, easy, isn't it? That is the takeaway point. Exclude animal products from your diet. Increase fiber in your diet. So that reinforces what the systemic review had told us already. So again, uh, when you're having a conversation with your rheumatologist or with your friends and family, take away these points, discuss about the potential role of animal protein in the inflammation in your gut, in the inflammation in your joints. So that that is the key. That's why animal protein is not uh, good for autoimmune disease in the sense that it aggravates the inflammation. And we know that inflammation is a huge trigger for autoimmune disease. So inflammation uh, can be prevented by moving away from an animal um, um, protein-based diet to a plant-based diet rich in diverse uh, fruit and vegetables, rich in omega-3 fatty acids, and rich in vitamin D. Now, um, uh, we talk about you know, rheumatoid arthritis, but we know it's a part of the autoimmune disease spectrum. We often find that in clinical practice and having spoken to uh, many patients with autoimmune disease that they are diagnosed with one disease and then, you know, a couple of years later, there's another, you know, label put onto them. So say they started with the rheumatoid arthritis, then they've got IBS. So and the incidence is increasing um, day by day of what we hear about it. So um, the link between diet and autoimmune disease has been studied extensively. So uh, to quote a few studies, which are, you know, quite large studies and have um, uh, advised plant-based diet and vegan diets. So the first one is a 2013 study by Tonstead, which uses the data from Adventist Health Study, which was which had nearly 66,000 people enrolled in it. So it showed us that it lowers the incidence and prevalence of autoimmune hyper, hypo and hyperthyroid disease uh, with people who are following vegan diets. So, and again, they found out that the inflammatory properties of animal products were the ones that were triggering off this autoimmune disease. So to go to second study, um, there are numerous, but these are the big ones, as I said. Uh, Laura et al. used the 1993 case control study. This was really interesting. You know, it had about 11,000 people in it and um, multiple sclerosis, positive association with meat and dairy, inverse association with fruit and vegetables. So the, this is the evidence we need to talk to people, to family, to, to our health professionals that Look at these studies, they're there. We need to incorporate more fruit and vegetables. We need to reduce the inflammation in our body. We need to move forward to an inclusive whole food plant-based diet. Now, uh, coming to the NICE guidelines for rheumatoid arthritis, NICE is the body, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK, which sets the gold standards for doctors to uh, you know, diagnose and treat uh, disease. So what does it say about rheumatoid arthritis? It says, use medication one for joint pains and symptoms. If medication one is not working, use medication two. If that is not working, use medication three. And the end point is surgery when there is complete total joint destruction. So yes, that is the protocol doctors are supposed to follow. But may I add, based on all the evidence we've just seen that we incorporate plant-based whole food diet, which would help us not progress from the stage of medication one to surgery. This is a very good plate um, of food, which is from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It recommends this um, whole food plant-based plate for a treating and reversing chronic disease. When we talk about chronic disease in lifestyle medicine, we generally talk about, 
you know, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and, um, you know, type 2 diabetes, or, you know, uh, some cancers like colon and breast cancer, so, uh, and high blood pressure. But I think autoimmune diseases should be a part of that spectrum as well, because as we've seen, the evidence for whole food plant-based plate is there is compelling. So what what is um, uh, what does this plate uh, tell us? It says fruit and vegetables, half of your plate. So the recommendation from NHS UK is five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. And I personally, in my practice, and which you know most of the NHS doctors are doing as well, is uh, recommending seven to ten. This is where the NHS guidelines are heading to as well. Is seven to ten portions of fruit and vegetables eating a rainbow diet, which incorporates various colors um, of food to increase the, uh, you know, the nutrition value in your diet. So a quarter of the plate. Now, before I come to the plant proteins, let's tell you, this is the question I get asked a lot in my clinical practice is, where do you get proteins from if you're going on a plant-based diet. I mean, so there is there are great leaflets on the plant-based health professional UK diets, which you can print and uh, you know give to patients and also um, use uh, to give it to your friends and family who are thinking of going on a plant-based diet or who are struggling to find out more about plant-based diets. So my take on plant proteins, when I try to explain this concept to my patients or friends and family is, that compare chickpea and chicken, and there is not an awful um, amount of difference in the amount of protein. I think for about 100 grams of chicken, it's 22 grams, and chickpea is 19. I would say that is not an awful lot of difference. And combined with it, the nutrition value chickpeas bring with the fiber. As we learned, you know, fiber is anti-inflammatory. So and animal protein don't have fiber. So there we go, all, and all the nutrition, like, uh, you know, micronutrients like iron. So plant protein is actually a powerhouse. It's packed uh, with other nutri nutrients as well. And um, coming to the uh, other quarter of the plate is whole grains, which would be, you know, brown rice, brown bread, quinoa, and the like. And add herbs and spices, drink plenty of water, at least six to eight glasses of water in a day. So that is a very good visual to have a look at what a uh, you know, plant-based, whole food plant-based plate looks like. And may I thoroughly recommend this plant-based eat well guide. This is from uh, Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. And what is the four key differences from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine guide that we've just seen? The key difference here is if you look at this portion this is about plant based milks so plant based milks are generally fortified with vitamin d we learned how important vitamin d is in preventing inflammation and stopping progression of autoimmune disease so um, uh, and they are also you know fortified with vitamin b12 so coming to the second key difference is this recommendation for vitamin b12 because if you are on a vegetarian or vegan diet you need vitamin b12 having said that even meat eaters later in life you know they do need vitamin b12 because they can't absorb it as well as um, they could before the third key difference here is the fermented food so we were talking in, in the, the last talk, we were talking about the gut microbiome, how important, you know, the gut is for your health. There, are, there is increasing research. Why? Because 70% of your immunity resides in the gut. There are various hypotheses, various studies which show that, you know, gut is the key. Sometimes, you know, in some studies have even said that autoimmune diseases are triggered by, you know, unhealthy choices, bad gut. And that's not surprising because by eating an, a you know, diet which is not rich in plants and which is not, um, you know, rich in whole food, you are changing the microbiome of your gut, which is responsible for, you know, the immunity in your gut, which is responsible for fighting all the infections and the inflammation away. So these fermented foods here, they help you in maintaining a good um, uh, gut flora. So also uh, we talk about unhealthy products, um, which is, you know, fourthly here, what you shouldn't eat. I think most of us know what we shouldn't eat. So I think when we are starting on our health journey, it should be about crowding out. And at uh, the British Society of 
lifestyle medicine, we talk about one change, which is, you know, slowly transitioning into a plant-based uh, lifestyle. If you've grown up, you know, eating animal-based food, obviously, you know, th thought of going on, a, going on a vegan diet or even on a vegetarian diet, it seems quite overwhelming. So where do you start? Start with one change. And what I usually recommend is that change be adding something uh, which is healthy in your diet, say, uh, add a bit of kimchi in your diet or add one tablespoon of flaxseed in your diet. So, you know, go step by step because anybody who's not uh, you know, say, for example, if you compare it to exercise, hasn't walked in years and we say, OK, right, you're not going to you're now going to do a sprint and we're going to time you that that approach doesn't work. So, yeah, one small change at a time, you know, take it easy, keep this um, stuck to your fridge wall. And that would help you to, you know, incorporate more fruit and vegetables, eat full, uh, whole grains and omega three and plant based milk. So, um why do we recommend whole food plant-based? We've learned about the evidence for vegan diets, for vegetarian diets, or plant-based diet. Now coming to, when we talk about diets, we also think about sustainability. Is this something sustainable? I mean, how many of us have started on a diet on the 1st of January and by the 15th of January, we are struggling? That is common, you know, that's, you know, that's testing your willpower. That's not what food should be about. Food, in my opinion, should be about nutrition, about nourishing yourself. So something that's sustainable and whole food plant-based diet in long-term studies and in personal experience, they are sustainable. They are evidence-based. We've, we've um, learned evidence about it. Now, a 2019 Eat Lancet Commission, there were experts from 16 countries who sat down and analyzed several hundreds of thousands of studies on nutrition and health. And guess what the winner was? A whole food plant-based diet. So, you know, um, in that planetary health plate, you know, every country's got their own health plate. We saw the American one, we saw the fantastic Eat Well Guide, and um, the, the planetary health plate they recommended, the egg, eggs, dairy, and poultry are considered optional, but, but we know that they are inflammatory, so it's best to avoid them. The new 2019 uh, um, American guidelines for prevention of cardiovascular disease, which again, I think it's double the risk of having a cardiovascular disease with rheumatoid arthritis, which is why lifestyle factors, including nutrition and exercise, play a key role in preventing cardiovascular disease. And that's why they're important in rheumatoid arthritis as well. So those guidelines specifically mention whole food plant-based diet as being helpful. Now, um, quick visual about um, omega-3 fatty acids. So flax seeds, algae, seaweed, a handful of walnuts, hemp seeds, chia seeds, they're all excellent sources of, you know, spirulina, omega-3, DHA, EF, EPA, they're excellent sources of omega-3 um, fatty acids. So, um, we, you know, there is a common opinion that you need to eat fish to get your omega-3 fatty acids. As we can see, we've got a variety of sources. The, the easiest way I find is that in my morning bowl of porridge, I add one tablespoon of flax seeds, ground flax seeds, and that's done. That's my cardiovascular risk prevention done. Um, so let's ponder over this after learning about the role of food and rheumatoid arthritis. Let your food be your medicine. I know you've heard that before, but reinforcing that, what we've learned today, plant-based diet is the key to prevent inflammation in your body. It's to prevent, as we know from previous study and experiences, prevent obesity, help in weight control, prevent cardiovascular disease, which again has a strong link with rheumatoid arthritis, doubling the chance of you having uh, cardiovascular disease and, uh, you know, certain cancers as well. So, um, you know, and other autoimmune disease like, you know, multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue syndrome, there is increasing evidence and increasing research about plant-based diet. So <laughs> vital information. Uh, for you uh, to share with your friends and family is that our lifestyle choices can be an important trigger to firing the gun. 
if you're carrying the genes for autoimmune disease, if you've got a family history of inflammatory bowel disease or, you know, um, thyroid problem or rheumatoid arthritis, you're carrying the genes. But what what can be the trigger? Your lifestyle choices can be the trigger. So they can be in the form of food, what you put on your plate, and also in the form of food that's not on your plate, which is the secondary food, which could be, you know, you've got immense stress in your life, or you had a an infection. There have been some. Um, there has have been some articles which quote um, infectious mononucleosis or infection with proteus can trigger off rheumatoid arthritis. But more research needs to be done into that. So what what happens if the gun is fired? There were you know we can't always prevent stress. We can't always prevent infection. Um, even though if we are eating healthy, so the gun has fired. What can you do? eat more plants eat more plants is the key thing you know diverse variety of plants in your diet more uh, you know protein in the form of legumes and in the form of pulses they're full of uh, protein and fiber so have that whole food plant based diet add in omega 3 to the diet as well as well as vitamin d that will control the damage going further on so those are the key things i want you to take away regarding nutrition is whole food plant based diet the, your genes are not your destiny you can change that by eating a whole food plant based diet adding omega 3 fatty acids and vitamin d to your diet so uh, breaking news, <laughs> animal products do not contain any fiber. I'm sure most of you knew that, but just to reemphasize. So uh, to say that, to summarize, the choice is ultimately, ultimately yours. So you, you want to go for a whole food plant-based diet? Yes, please do. It will decrease the risk of your cardiovascular disease. It will decrease the chance of obesity. It will decrease the chance of hypertension. It will decrease the chance of type, type 2 diabetes. So the choice is entirely yours, autoimmune conditions as well as we've learned. So that was to summarize about the role of plants in autoimmune diseases and generally in you know um, leading a healthy full li life with um, a decrease in the chance of chronic disease. So uh, coming to exercise, what about exercise? Uh, I find that uh, whenever I have a consultation with someone with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis as well, the limiting factor is pain. So it is natural to avoid exercising when you've got pain, you know, you don't have to push yourself if you can't barely, if you can barely walk in the morning. So, but what does exercise actually do? So the um, evidence or the benefits, sorry, the of exercise are threefold. It improves your muscle strength and flexibility. So when your muscle strength is increased and you're more flexible, that decreases the stiffness in the joint, which has a knock-on effect on the pain. So naturally, pain is reduced as well. And the second is the weight-bearing exercises, which helps to keep the bones strong, which in turn decreases the risk of osteoporosis, the thinning of bones. And the third is balance exercises. They reduce the risk of falls. So less falls, less chance of fractures. So threefold benefits there of exercise, um, generally in general population and in rheumatoid arthritis in particular. Now let's look at this. This is like this <laughs> circle of rheumatoid arthritis. We learned that rheumatoid arthritis is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Hence, lifestyle is very important. So exercise, we know from numerous studies, it is uh, evidence-based that it decreases the risk of cardiovascular disease. So, you know, the 30 minutes of exercise per day or 150 minutes of aerobic exercise is what the NHS recommends that you do. So exercise also helps with management of weight, which we know further reduces the risk of cardiovascular diseases. And then that again muscle strengthening that we get because of exercise leads to more support and movement the joints become supple and uh, you know that that has actually i've seen in practice that increases the positive attitude towards exercise as well so it is a circle once you start exercising you you know the feel good chemicals the feel good hormones serotonin they you feel like exercising more i'm sure most of you must have experienced that um, so going through what do the various professional 
organizations around the world recommend for rheumatoid arthritis patients. So um, when I was reading about this, and uh, it was very interesting what the American and the British Society of Rheumatology say about exercise, which is not much. So American College of Rheumatology says um, there's no mention of physical active activity, but physical therapy like hydrotherapy is recommended. And um, it's the same with the British Society of Rheumatology. It, it says aerobic exercise needs to be encouraged, but it has a caveat that minimize joint destruction. So it's like, you know, you, you, uh, cautioning people about that. But the best advice, I think, in my opinion, comes from the Royal Australian College of GPs, which says it sh exercise should be individualized for the three important things we talked about, strength, endurance, anaerobic capacity. So wonderful. I think this is what we need um, in the British Society of Rheumatology guidelines as well. And the EULA, the European League guidelines, also talk about non-pharmacological interventions as adjuncts. Again, they talk about occupational therapy, hydrotherapy, and a dynamic exercise. But um, I think the key is individualized exercise. No two people are the same. Two people with rheumatoid arthritis are not uh, the same either. So it should be an individualized exercise for strength, endurance, and aerobic capacity. Now let's meet our patient, Mrs. X. She is 35 years old. She feels like a uh, 90 year old. <laughs> and she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at the age of 30 years. So as we were talking earlier about the NICE guidelines, you know, painkillers started on medication, hydroxychloroquine by the rheumatologist progressive worsening of joint pains asked you consider going on methotrexate. That's when, you know, went to the doctor in the sky, Google, methotrexate, side effects, blood tests, she panicked. So she came, uh, discussed this with me, her general practitioner and lifestyle medicine physician, and incorporated whole food plant-based diet and exercise in her daily routine. So no processed food or fizzy drinks, gave up smoking and lost five kilos of weight. Any surprises in the result? One year on, she's medication free, she's pain free, and her inflammatory marker CRP is in the normal range. It hadn't been in the last five years. So I think we, you know, this is not just one patient, there are many other patients, their case studies on and on. So we need to be aware as health professionals about the role of plant-based diet and exercise. And as the general public, we need to be aware about talking about this to our rheumatologist, talking about this to our lifestyle medicine physician, talking about this to our general practitioners. And, um, you know, this, is, I think, is the way forward. So the lifestyle first approach, you know, as conventional doctors, we, um, uh, talk about, okay, you've got high blood pressure, here is your tablet. And then, by the way, you need to exercise and lose some weight as well. So what is different in lifestyle medicine is the lifestyle first approach. It is the key. I must say, though, it has to be individualized. You know, no two people are the same, as I said. So um, what are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine? We have talked in detail and in some detail about exercise and a whole food plant-based diet now, but it also emphasizes about stress reduction, positive psychology, and stopping smoking, alcohol, and uh, other drugs, and also about sleep management. So all six of these factors together caused rheumatoid arthritis remission or the uh, you know the pain free status of this lady here so that is worth talking to your doctors about to have an individual plan for your exercise and discussing about the evidence of whole food plant based diet we learned today so to summarize the talk i'd say it's seek advice about individualized aerobic strengthening and balance exercises and lifestyle first approach can help in relieving the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis like they did for this lady. This could be me, this could be you. And eat a rainbow of fruit and vegetables every day. Increase your fiber intake. Supplements to be used are omega-3 and vitamin D. 
Here are the links to all the references I've used in my talk today. And I would say thank you so much for listening to me, my audience. And thank you so much to Dr. Shireen and Dr. Layla for giving me this uh, opportunity and to Pete and Tom from VegFest UK. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Alpha. That was really interesting. I, one of the things I actually wrote it down was, you know, even when the gun has fired, plants can do the damage control. I really love that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to remember that. Uh, there's actually one question from a lady called Margaret. She has been eating a whole food plant-based diet, and she takes vitamin D every day. And she has stopped eating nightshades because she believes that they are a trigger. But she still experiences some pain in her legs and lower back. Any advice? Right. So, um, it Obviously, we give individual advice for patients depending on their individual circumstances. And uh, talking about vitamin D, yes, we do recommend, especially if you're in the UK or in a country where there's not enough sun in the winter, that 10 micrograms should be taken from the months of October until March every day, which I suppose Margaret is doing already. But then depending, you know, usually people have low levels if they are of you know, if they are dark skin like me asian background you need to increase the dose then in that case or if you're indoors mainly so it might be that the dose that she's taking is not enough so it might be worthwhile checking that with her general practitioner because you know low vitamin d as we know is associated with um, you know uh, body aches general fatigue which again is a symptom of rheumatoid arthritis and low mood as well so it might be worthwhile checking that and um, interesting, you bring the point about nightshade. So um, if we go into the root cause of disease, into the gut microbiome, which I briefly touched on, they say that nightshades like eggplants and tomatoes can help with joint pain. But again, this is not like a blanket statement. It wouldn't work for everyone. I've had patients with rheumatoid arthritis who stopped eating all nightshades but still had symptoms. So, But some people do find that it helps them. Uh, there are not many studies around it, but you know, if, if uh, she's given that up, I would say you know, the next step would be exercise to see into what she is really doing in terms of exercise so seems like she's got vitamin d in her diet and perhaps omega-3 as well and uh, you know whole food plant-based diet um, like the plate we discussed from our plant-based health professionals and plenty of water and um, you know every person is different the rate of disease progression in everyone is different so it's best to you know see a lifestyle medicine physician and see what you know check your vitamin d levels and see if there's something missing in the diet or sometimes i find that people can get you know repetitive in what they're eating not getting the whole spectrum or not getting the whole rainbow in their diet so that might help as well thank you hope that answers the question thank you yeah that that is good and i think you know i would like to add a lot of people say you know they eat a whole food plant-based diet and i'm sure it has been your experience as well but when we really look at the plague at what they eat every single day yes it is whole food plant-based but you know you could have for example uh, avocados every day you know a, one avocado so it is you know a lot of fat uh, yeah. it is healthy but then you know there is no there isn't enough balance or uh, i don't know if it was i think karine mentioned that earlier you're having hummus every day but with chickpeas you know you, you need variety and it's also about having as you mentioned you know those 10 portions of fruits and vegetables so I would say optimize your uh, diet first. You know, have a look, have a really an honest look at your plate and see, you know, what changes you can uh, make actually to, you know, make it even better. So, and yes, and as you showed, I like the Eat Well Guide uh, myself, you know, the plant based. I always use that. Uh, so, have a look at it and, you know, compare. So, I think yeah. that would be. I think print out a picture of a rainbow, put it on your fridge, and tick box every day. Exactly. So yes. <laughs> just make yes. sure you're getting the rainbow in your diet every day. <laughs> Yeah, I think initially that would help actually because you need to change your habit, which is actually going to be uh, the topic of our next uh, talk. Uh, you know, changing habits is not easy. And until you get there, you need to have reminders, you know. So, you know, having a printout, I would agree, it's a good uh, thing to do. Now, somebody's asking, uh, do you recommend any probiotics? Well, probiotics, um, interesting field again, you know, the gut microbiome is such an evolving field that we're learning new things about it every day. So studies done in the past have recommended the role of probiotics, especially, you know, containing lactobacillus and bacteria, various kinds of bacteria there which help in the gut. Um, you know, flora. But as we saw in the Eat Well guide, that we can do that with 
fermented, um, you know, fru uh, um, uh, fermented food in our diet. That can be done. Or when you're eating a variety of food, again, you know, the gut microbiome is healthy. So imagine, you know, a group of children sitting together. I, I, I'm sure if you give them gummy bears, they'll all be happy. But imagine these are a group of grown-ups sitting in your tummy and they, you know, they are craving for different colors of food. So if you are giving them, your gut microbiome is healthy. But probiotics and prebiotics is an ever developing field and functional medicine is more kind of geared towards that into uh, ensuring the gut health and root cause health. So they do recommend that you take you know, probiotics every day, especially if you are suffering with autoimmune conditions or gut related conditions like inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, thank you. Just one more question, actually, uh, from myself. You know, you mentioned that, you know, we shouldn't eat any animal products. Obviously, we all agree that, you know, it is a plant-based <laughs> expo here. Uh, so are there any other foods you would say, you know, which we should, you know, people with rheumatoid arthritis should avoid? I think we've, um, animal protein is the key that you should avoid because of the inflammatory effects. And, you know, generally we live in a day and age where kindness, we, uh, you know, last year has been an awakening about that. So kindness to animals, kindness to your own body. So animal protein. The second thing which is coming again and again in various studies is a spot in, you know, the um, uh, sweetener that we use. So there have been some studies um, which are, which I wouldn't say they're robust enough, but patients find that that can aggravate their pain. So they have been linked uh, between the neuronal, neuronal pathways of pain and the artificial sweetness. So if you are going on a whole food plant-based diet, and if you are trying to, um, you know, relieve the symptoms of arthritis, I would say that's one thing you should um, not have in your diet as well. And um, as Margaret mentioned, nightshade, that's again an evolving fe field into what you shouldn't uh, be incorporating. Having said that, uh, the huge evidence is for dairy, you know, deleting dairy from your diet. Uh, there has been, there have been many studies which uh, show that, you know, improvement in joint health, improvement in overall fatigue, and in autoimmune diseases, general well-being, you, you know, feeling better mentally as well. So that's another thing. And, um, um, you know, generally eating a whole food plant-based diet. So avoiding those three key things. I must also add gluten is another thing that is being studied again and again. There is some evidence. Um, there are actually three big studies which have shown that eliminating gluten from the diet has helped in symptoms. But again, they come. the conclusion comes with a warning that it is an individualized approach. So again, you can try that. That's a part of elimination diet that functional medicine doctors and functional medicine uh, practitioners do for autoimmune disease. But that's something that you can look into and discuss with your you know, doctors when you see your lifestyle medicine specialist, when you see your general practitioner or, or your rheumatologist, you can have a chat about whether it's sensible to do that. And you know, maintaining a food diary like we do for what we're adding in our diet, you can also maintain one for what you're deleting and whether it's helping your symptoms. Yes, that's lovely, thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, we need to have an individual approach to nutrition. For example, I'm, um, uh, you know, kind of sensitive to garlic. <laughs> and it is such a good, actually, you know, garlic is so healthy and everybody has it you know, in their diet, but I know I'm sensitive. So I think we should always just, you know, uh, you know, appreciate that there are individual kind of, you know, sensitivity. So yes, that, and you can experiment, can't you? Yes, absolutely. You know, it's try and see what works for you. So no harm done there. You know, as long as you're doing it sensibly in a sensible way and, and if you need guidance for excluding things. So and as I said, you know, don't do it all in one go. Just that is why most diets fail, because, you know, you just completely change your lifestyle into what you're not used to. And at the end of the day, the cra cravings will come back on and you will give in. So one small change at a time and um, hopefully it will be in the right direction. Yes, and also I think you know if you change everything uh, overnight, you wouldn't know which one was it. Was it the gluten you should have avoided, or the nightshades, or you know? So it is good actually to do it in steps. And like you said, you know, it takes a while actually to get used to the new tastes. So yeah. just take your time. And the other thing I would like to add is that you know, out there there is a lot of. Um, kind of confusing messages, you know, I get a lot of people saying, oh, but this doctor says I should avoid that, this uh, doctor says this. So I think, you know, just bear in mind, 
a lot of times, as I said, again, it is a repetition of what you just mentioned. It, we need to have an individual approach. So, and there are people like Dr. Kumar and, you know, plant-based health online is there. So you can, you, there is help out there, you know, for somebody to have actually a look at what you eat, at your food diary and guide you, you know, what changes you should be making. Absolutely. We're all here for you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you very much, Dr. Kumar. Uh, thank you, Alpa. I really enjoyed it. And I hope that the audience also enjoyed it. And uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. You too. A pleasure and thank an honor. You. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so our next uh, speaker is Jenny Fernandez. She's a health coach. And uh, I think health coaches, it's a new field, actually, um, especially in the UK. It has been obviously longer uh, around you know, in the US. And so she's going to talk to us a little bit about like kind of, you know, what is health coaching and what we should be doing. Jenny, are you there? Do you want to join us? I'm here. Hi, Leila. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Leila. How are you Hi. here? Yes, I'm here. Good to see you. Thank you so much yeah. for having me on. Thank you. So let me just say a few words about you. She is a, Jenny is a rehabilitation physiotherapist with a master's degree in preventive cardiology. And you have been actually working, you know, over 20 years in NHS, you know, dealing with patients and people with a wide range of conditions. But then you made the switch to health coaching, which I find quite interesting. So do you want to tell us, you know, just let's start there. Why did you change your, you know, your career path? Okay, so if I, if I can set a little context to the story, um, I, I experienced a, a health revelation of my own in my mid-20s, and that came through exercise, and that's actually what led me to train as a physiotherapist. And I found that I really enjoyed my work, particularly in uh, community rehabilitation, which I specialised in. I enjoyed the personal touch of working with a person in their own home, problem solving with them. It was very different to being in the sterile environment of a hospital. But I always felt that there was something missing and I wasn't really quite sure what it was. So years later, I, um, I came across a health coach, a, a vegan health coach, and we had a chat and my interest was really piqued. So I went on to do some more research and looked into, you know, what does it actually mean to be a health coach? And then I decided to train. And I really do feel that having, um, you know, having had this training to be a holistic health coach specializing in habit change, I really think that was the, um, the, the, the piece of the jigsaw that was missing for me. So that, that's really what propelled me to go forwards. That's really interesting. It's always like kind of, you know, there is a story and I think it actually helps knowing the story, <laughs> you know, why actually did you make the switch? And it is a new field, isn't it? And, you know, you talk about a holistic health. Do you want just to talk a little bit about that? What do you mean? So, you know, f I think it was mentioned by the, by the previous speaker. So I'm just going to repeat the same thing, really. But it's the six pillars of lifestyle medicine that completely encompass um, holistic health for me. So it, it's the, the whole food plant based diet. We saw the, the, you know, the beautiful picture of the eat well plate. It's movement and exercise. It's stress management. It's getting good restorative sleep that actually, you know, really replenishes your body and allows you to heal. It's about avoiding the usual suspects, smoking, uh, alcohol, uh, drugs in general. And also, you know, these um, having meaningful social interactions in your day to day life. That That's key to, you know, and the beauty of these six pillars of lifestyle medicine is they tend to sort of intermingle and they have knock-on effects one on the other. So it's um, th that for me encompasses it beautifully. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't say any more than that. Yeah, I agree. And you know, if you think about it, you, the first one you mentioned was, uh, you know, a whole food plant-based diet, which is the focus of our talks today. And uh, again, as you know, if people have been listening, that is what we keep saying. You know, whole food. You know, it's, it's really simple: legumes, whole grains fruits and vegetables. So what about, uh, you know, movement and exercise? Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, each pillar? Well, I mean, you know, as, as a physiotherapist, it's, a, and as I said, it was a transformative experience with exercise that led me to train as a, as a physiotherapist. So um, 
movement and exercise is key. And actually, there is some interesting work in um, in the world of behavior change, the trans theoretical model of change by Prochaska and Clementi. It's known as um, uh, it's known as the the habit change model. Um, it's very interesting that when they uh, looked at behavior change for um, you know for di for different issues exercise and diet really paired well together. So in other words, when they were looking to help people to improve their health, they could work on those two goals simultaneously. They really support each other. Whereas if someone wanted to give up smoking and they wanted to eat um, more healthily, those two didn't really pair up so well. So you sort of had to choose one to focus on and then deal with that one and move on to the next one. But health and exercise uh, go to, uh, sorry, food and exercise go together. And I, ju I just think they are the cornerstone of, of good health. Um, I think that's actually very interesting you say that, uh, you know, that they go together. And, you know, a lot of people who, you know, I see, for example, and they want to lose weight, there's always this issue, you know, like kind of, you know, people say, but I exercise every day, I'm not losing weight. And I think, yes, um, you know, you know, by doing actually physical activity, you can help your weight loss journey, but we exercise for other reasons, you know, just for feeling good. Again, uh, the health benefits, but just, you know, boosting your mood. And once you, you actually feel better in yourself, you're more likely to eat a healthier diet. It's almost like kind of, you know, I have exercise, let me have a better diet, let me choose the better, healthier option, isn't it? Well, it is. It's almost like I don't want to undo all the hard work that I've done with exercise because obviously you're improving the function of your heart and lungs, you're, you're strengthening your muscles, you're strengthening your bones, your tendons. You know, you're just you're you're pushing when you're exercising, you're pushing all that blood across your body, you're perfusing all your tissues in your body. Um, you, you know, it's it's really if you know, I, I remember being on a course once saying that, you know, if you could put all the benefits of exercise into a pill, <laughs> that whoever did that would just never have to work again. There'd be a multimillionaire overnight. So, you know, I, I can't stress more how, how important exercise is. And you're absolutely right for the mood, the feel good factor. You sleep better you know, all sorts of things, body image, you know, if your body, if your body starts to change, you're happier with the reflection that you see in the mirror, you know, that's, that's just a positive. It's just, it's a, it's an endless list of positives that come out of exercise, really. Yeah, and you mentioned it earlier that all these six pillars you talked about, they actually interlink, like kind of, you know, you, even now you mentioned when you exercise, you sleep better. And it's also good for stress management. Yes. Yes, so absolutely. yeah, it's almost like kind of, you know, by doing one, uh, you know, you tap into the next one and, you know, it just, uh, it feeds off each other. So it's really good. I, I like that. Now, so again, this is a new field and a lot of people don't know, uh, you know, why they should actually seek out a health coach. So why do you think health coaching is important? Well, I, I think uh, if you look you know, at the state of, of health in the UK today, and actually not just in the UK, but across the world. You know, I think we probably all agreed that we're not in a, in a great place. So, um, you know, we see rising levels of, of obesity and diabetes. And very worryingly, we're seeing this trend in children and in quite young children. And that's actually something that's, that I personally find alarming. And I think, all healthcare professionals, uh, you know, would consider this to be alarming. You look at Alzheimer's disease, which again is another disease that's lifestyle mediated. It, it's destined to be the most expensive healthcare cost in the United States by 2050. And as you know, in the UK, we're only ever two or three steps behind the United States. So we're on the same trajectory. Um, cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart disease, the, 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 the lifestyle mediated cancers, you know, just think of the, the toll of misery and pain and disability that they cause. And that's despite decades of us throwing millions and millions of pounds at testing and research and developing new drugs. And, and you know, yet we're still living with, with, with these diseases. 
you know, the list goes on. We've just heard all about autoimmune diseases. We know that there are gastric problems, skin problems. We know that people who have um, diabetes, hypertension, or are obese, they um, they are they're at risk of, of uh, if they contract COVID of having you know a, a, a more severe disease. So, you know, I could go on forever. The list is pretty much endless. And and I think that the current medical model of drugs and surgery has its place. It you know it's given humanity some astonishing benefits. So I would never want to say that that you know that we don't need them. But I think when you're looking at lifestyle diseases or diseases that are caused by lifestyle what what do we actually mean by that we're talking about poor habits unhealthy habits that are the cause of the disease in the first place there is not a single pill yet in the world that can dissolve an unhealthy habit there's not a scalpel or a surgeon anywhere who can cut out an unhealthy habit he or she can cut off your gangrenous diabetic foot but can't cut out the behavior that led to that in the first place so I think this is where health coaching steps in I think it has to be it has to run hand and glove with a new medical model you know what I have as a health coach is the ability to give a patient space and time to consider you know where they are what the future could look like for them what the future will be if they continue in the current trajectory and to help them overcome all those obstacles and barriers to making these choices, the, well, these changes. And, you know, there, there are some people who might have a, a short consultation with their GP, a little bit of advice, and, you know, they pick that up and they run with it. But lots of people don't. Lots of people really struggle because, you um, daily life gets in the way they're under pressure they've got things to do uh, they need that extra support and i i do think the day will come when we have a health coach in every gp surgery in fact probably more than one health coach in every gp surgery because you know the tide the tide of chronic diseases doesn't show any sign of abating at the moment yeah, so I, agree. I think, and I think you would, you know, it would be so great to have a health coach, you know, with every, you know, in, in a, a, every, you know, GP surgery because, and I think it is about, you know, if we do something um, once a week, that is not a habit. A habit is something we do every single day, and it really builds up. You know, maybe let's talk about food, like you know, an ice cream every week. That's not gonna really make you put on weight or cause any other major health issues but if you have it every single day then it does you know create problems and i think a lot of times we are not even aware of it you know and that's why we need the help of somebody we just need help let's put it that way we really need help somebody to guide us and uh, make those changes so what is the most common problem you know people come to see you with yeah that, that's a really good question um you know, I, I think people often come and see a health coach because they're actually not quite sure what's wrong. So, you know, they have this feeling that something needs to change and they will say something like, I want to feel better. I want to have more energy. I want to be able to do things. I, I want to eat better. I want to have, um, I want to improve my my lifestyle. So the these are all things that are that are quite um, they're quite non-specific. It's uh, you know very different. You will go to the doctor and say, "Well, look, I've got this pain here, or whatever it is." It's a, you know it's, a, it's it's more targeted. So um, you know, my job as a coach is to really dig deep and find out. Well, what does feel better actually mean? You know, what's not feeling good at the moment? What what is feeling better? What's the vision that that person has? And you know that's quite um, that that's quite a process. That that that's quite a, a lot of work that sometimes has to happen to to really dig down, really find out what's motivating the person, really let them let them dream a little bit about what the future could look like. It's it's about opening possibilities up for them. It's about finding what's really important to them. So you know, for example. Um, I, I remember a gentleman who had been to his doctor and the doctor had said, uh, you need to um, 
you, you need to do something about your blood pressure and your cholesterol because they're high. So, you know, I, I saw this gentleman and he told me that and I asked him, well, how important is that to you from a scale of naught to 10? You know, where zero is, it's not important at all. And 10 is it's the most important thing in my life. And he said, well, it's a four because the doctor's given me pills and I intend to take them. So, yeah, it's a four out of 10. Well, a four out of 10 is not a really good score to be able to start implementing habit change. So I had to dig deeper with this gentleman and ask him, well, you know, what really matters to you? What, what is it that you want to do that you can't do? And he thought for a bit and he said, do you know what? I want to be able to kick a football in the park with my grandchildren at the weekends. That's what I really want to do. I want my grandchildren to remember me as a grandfather who was fun, not some grumpy old man who was stuck in, a, in, in an armchair all the time. And he said, I just can't do it. I'm carrying too much weight. My joints ache. I get breathless. I never have enough energy to do anything. And, you know, um, that that's really upsetting. So I thanked him for sharing that story. And this is what I mean about digging deeper. That's when you get those stories from people. And I asked him to score that from 0 to 10. Well, what do you think the score was, Leila? What was it? Six, it was a seven. nine or a ten. Wow, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. But that's that's the hook, you see. That's the hook. So as a coach, I have to explore. I then provide support and guidance. But most importantly, I also provide accountability. So I can hold up that mirror to that gentleman. Whenever he's flagging, I can say, well, what about kicking the football in the park with the grandchildren? You know, that that's so so we we make sure that we go on the right path. And the other beautiful thing about the whole process is the changes that he had to make in order to play football with his grandchildren were exactly the same steps that brought down his blood pressure and his cholesterol. But, you know, if we'd focused on the blood pressure and the cholesterol, we wouldn't have got the results. But because we focused on what really meant something to him, on the emotional side, on the things that were important to him in life, we had good results. Yeah. I so think the coaching... Go on, sorry. No, 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 go on, go on. I think focusing on numbers can actually be frustrating. If you're chasing numbers, you know, my cluster was this, now I need to bring it down. And, you know, it just it adds to frustration. And obviously, you don't want to kind of be feeling frustrated and stressed. It's not going to help you change your habits, uh, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some people who will be motivated by the numbers and then that's fine because you focus on the numbers. But but I think generally m most times people are, are they're more concerned about the things that are meaningful in their life and, and, you know, the things that bring them joy, the things that bring them love. Those are the things that really motivate them to change. Yes. And I think, again, it is a lot of us, actually, a lot of people have forgotten what health means being healthy. I mean, the society, the uh, information we get, you know, from the media, it has kind of normalized being unhealthy, being unfit. So people don't actually dare to drink. You know, this gentleman you just uh, uh, told us about, like, you know, he actually didn't dare to believe that it is possible for him to be that healthy so that he can kick a, you know, a ball with his grandchildren. So I think, you know, again, we just need people to help us yeah, to dream, as corny as it sounds. <laughs> that is what we need, isn't it? It is. It's completely. That's exactly what it is. And yes, you're right. It does sound corny. You know, no one goes to their doctor saying, doctor, help me dream, you know. <laughs> but 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 if you don't dream, you 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 won't start to you won't start to explore the possibilities that are out there for you to take. You'll just remain stuck. You know, there's a saying, isn't there? If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. But exactly. dreaming does allow you to sort of expand and, and to move out and to try something different, expand your horizons. Expand, you know, and have a vision, you know, a better vision, something better for the future. Now, we talked about, you know, changing habits, and which is actually probably the cornerstone of actually changing your life. You know, if you want to change your lifestyle, you need to change the habits which make up the, that lifestyle. So how, you know, how do we do that? Any tips? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, ha habits are, um, are fascinating. We, we need habits because um, we are a large percentage or a considerable percentage 
of everything we do every day is based on habits. And this just frees up computational space in the brain to allow you to think of something else. So I like to think of habits as a record, a song. So the record is recorded with all its unique grooves and, 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 and troughs in the record, and that's imprinted in the brain. It's essentially, it's, it's a scheme of behaviors. It's a blueprint, it's a map of a certain set of behaviors. And a habit, in order for the habit to, for that record to play, the habit has to be triggered. So a really easy example is brushing your teeth before you go to bed. The trigger is I'm going to bed. So that triggers the behavior to go into the bathroom, brush your teeth. You don't even have to think about it. You just do it automatically. And then there's a reward. The reward is, uh, you know, in the teeth cleaning thing, oh, I've got nice, fresh, minty breath and my teeth are clean. So habits, once they're established, they're always there. That record is always recorded somewhere in the brain. But that doesn't mean that we are destined to live, you know, that we're predestined to live through this automated behavior, you know, that we're going to sing the same song forever. You know, through the beauty of neuroplasticity, the brain has the ability to learn and to form new connections and to record a different song. So when you want to record a different song, you know, it might be I want to eat fruit for breakfast every day. That's your new song. There's an element. You set up the trigger. You have the element of practice and repetition and you have the reward. And where the health coach really steps in with this is there are four things that have to happen for that habit to become cemented and to become part of what that person does every day. You have to start easy. I mean, the previous speaker spoke about this as well. You really do have to start by making things easy so that they're attainable and the person can um, experience success. Can you imagine if you set a goal and you keep trying and trying and trying and you just undershoot the goal? How frustrating would that be? You would soon give up because, you know, you, you just you just run out of motivation and motivation is not a good thing to rely on anyway because it fluctuates. So it's about making it easy. It's about allowing the person to um, experience success and then really importantly, celebrating that success. There's evidence that's coming out um, about changing habits. And I found this quite surprising, but the element of celebrating the success is actually more important than how many times you repeat the process. So I thought that was really interesting. And I think sometimes we're not very good at celebrating our successes, myself included. You know, I, I find that quite difficult, um, but I, I've learned I've learned how to do it. There are ways of doing it which seem very alien when you first start practicing, but then, you know, they become more natural. And then the fourth thing is that the process needs to be fun. No one is going to want to do something that's a drudge that that's, you know, it's a bit like, you know, at work, it's like, oh, no, it's time for the monthly spreadsheet again. We don't want that kind of mentality. We want people to be um, infused by what they're doing, you know, happy to feel to feel that sense of accomplishment. And and, and that's what happens. It's the emotions again. It's the emotions that sent that, 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 that will that will cement that into the brain. Yes, it is part of the you know, neuroplasticity, isn't it? That, you know, when you're creating, um, I, I don't like to say habit, because when each time we say habit, people assume automatically that it is a bad thing. But as you mentioned, some habits are actually good. And in fact, when you create new habits, you want the, those new actions to, to, you know, turn into habits so that you don't have to think about them, you know, all the time. You know, you just do it automatically instead of having, I don't know, uh, that chocolate in the afternoon, you grab the banana. So you want them actually to turn into habits. And I think as you say, it you need to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you're not going to stick to it. You know, it's not going to last. Now, obviously, it's a plant-powered uh, expo. So we have people who are already vegan and uh, some people who might consider going vegan or, you know, just give it a try. So do you have any, you know, tips for, let's say, three top tips for new vegans? Yeah, um... I mean, first of all, let me celebrate our new vegans. You know, it's fantastic. You, you're, you've done something amazing for your health and for the planet, for the animals. It's, a, it's an incredible choice that, you, that you've decided to make. So I think what I would say if you're a new vegan, 
please don't be hard on yourself and don't expect perfection. You know, you're embarking on a journey of discovery. That's what veganism is. You learn something all the time. And, and you know, if you mess up one day, you're only human. Every single one of us who is vegan, we have messed up along the way. And, you know, we probably, you know, it, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that we will mess up at some point. So don't give yourself a hard time and actually celebrate that success. It's so important that veganism becomes a joyful part of your life. Because as you know, everything that I've just said about how you create new habits, this is a new song. Sing that song with joy so that it becomes, you know, your default mechanism. You'll, you'll find over time the choices, you know, where you start off and you're, you know, reading labels all the time in the supermarket and looking, what does this mean? What does that mean on your phone? You know, you'll assimilate all of that with time and it will just become automatic and you'll just automatically make the choices that align with your values and allow you to live the life that you want to live. So please celebrate and don't be hard on yourself. I think tip number two, I'd like to talk about the meat substitutes. So, um, you know, the, the, the plant meat substitutes are great products to get you started. Um, they allow you to just recreate a dish that you've always loved without having to think too hard. Habit change, make it easy. These products make it easy for you to, to, to become vegan. However, what I would say is, you know, I'm advocating for health and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt because I felt it in my own body and because, as we know, there is just a stack of research to support it. A whole food plant-based diet is the one that's going to give you long-lasting health. You know, that's not to say that you're never going to get sick, but you're stacking the odds in your favor to be healthy for the rest of your life. So what I would say, use those meat substitutes in the beginning to get you started. They're also really useful if you're going out to dinner with friends and you don't go to a vegan restaurant. Most places do have, you know, some sort of substitute that you can order. So it means, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to be a hermit. You can still see your friends. Um, they're useful as well if you want to invite people home. You want to cook for them, you can use a meat substitute. But let's take a dish like spaghetti bolognese. You know, you would have started off before you were vegan using a meat mince. Now you've gone vegan and you're using a vegan mince. Well, take that the next step along and make the spaghetti bolognese in exactly the same way. But instead of adding a vegan mince, you're going to add a tin of lentils or you're going to crumble some tempeh. Use the same herbs, use the same spices, enjoy the meal in exactly the same way. But I would urge you to just try and do that. You can make simple swaps, you know, uh, brown rice instead of white rice, wholemeal bread instead of white bread, wholemeal pasta instead of white pasta. These little things that you can add into your journey as you go along. So I think that that would be crucial. And then... Um, we said three tips, didn't we? Yes, okay. I mean, that's fine. You can just, I, I love those two anyway. And I also want to ask you, you know, for a tip for those who are already vegan, just go with that now. Let's, uh, you know, for people who are listening and they are already vegan, because as, you know, from the previous talks, uh, we know, you know, uh, eliminating animal products from our diets is good and healthy. So what is the next step? What is a tip for those who are already following a vegan diet? So people who are vegan and want to be healthier, again, if you're not on the whole food plant based journey, just get on to it. Uh, we, you know what the products are. They're, 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 you know, whole foods, whole grains, beans, legumes, the, the, the soya products, tofu, tempeh, fresh fruit and vegetables, nuts and seeds and fermented foods. Start to introduce these foods if you're not already eating them and aim to reach 95 percent of the time. So that still leaves you 5% of the time that you can enjoy your, you know, vegan junk food, whatever that is. And make sure that you and new vegans as well, make sure that you get your nutrition advice from a really reputable source. So it's very tempting to follow, you know, a, a YouTuber or a blogger or somebody on, on Instagram. But, you know, my suggestion would be that you go to someone like the Vegan Society or you go to Plant-Based Health Professionals um, UK because they have 
absolutely incredible resources, including some fa fantastic uh, fact sheets for different conditions and different things. And there's lots and lots of research there if you want to look at the evidence yourself, which, you know, I would urge you to do if that's what you want to do. Um, so I think that's what I would say to um, existing vegans. Make that switch if you haven't made it already. And secondly, if you're not doing this, I would suggest that you adopt a stress management technique into your daily routine. And now that can be anything. You know, you could dance to your favorite song. You could go for a jog. You might want to journal at night before you go to bed and just jot down in a, in a book, you know, things that are on your mind or what's happened during the day. You might want to pick up a meditation practice. I mean, all these things, they're, they're evidence based as well, you know, um, walking in nature. But what I would say is make that a habit so that you do it five minutes every day five, 10 minutes every day, that's going to be far more beneficial to you than doing a two hour blast once a month. So try and think a little bit about, well, what time of day would be best for me? So let's take the example of a meditation practice. You might like to do it in the morning when you get up. So that's a, a question of just setting your alarm 10 minutes earlier and making that a habit. Use an app. There's a really good app called Medito, M-E-D-I-T-O. It's free. Headspace is another good app, but you have to pay for that, you know, and then you just do that every day and build it into your life and, and kind of treat it as this is my time for me. This is my time to let go. This is my time to not worry about everything that I have to do. And then it really has value and it becomes, you know, a method for you to manage stress in your life. So those would be those would be my suggestions. Yeah, I think stress management is so important. I mean, we we stress it, you know. <laughs> so actually, you know, it's almost like, like what we were discussing earlier about the six pillars. And it is part of it. And I think it should really be addressed, especially with everything that is going on at the moment, isn't it? It, it is. We need it. You know, our, busy, our lives are so busy. We need to have a practice. Again, something like you said, which we do every day, not just once in a blue moon. So we need to have a practice. That, I really love that. And I also love what you said. That is something I always mention in my talks as well. If you want to get your information about a you know, vegan plant-based diet, get it from a you know, trustworthy source, Vegan Society, Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. I mean, nowadays there are so many bloggers, uh, which is good. I mean, they are trying to spread the message, but they don't have the qualifications necessarily. And so, you know, by all means, if you read an article, just uh, check the qualifications, see if, uh, you know, what they are talking about is based on science. Otherwise, Vegan Society and Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. And obviously, I'm biased because I'm from Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. <laughs> of course. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Just uh, one question. Uh, imagine somebody's listening to you and they are really, uh, you know, inspired uh, by what you are saying and they think, oh gosh, you know, uh, my brother, my sister or my mother could actually really use a health coach. Could they actually book an appointment for them? Well, okay, so first of all, um, I only see adults, so I wouldn't see anybody under the age of 18. And secondly, I, I think what's important to understand that, you know, health coaching is a process and it does go deep. So the person who's receiving the health coaching has to want to engage in this process and, and has to be, has to, you know, want to make change. So if you're thinking, yeah, I, I'd love this for my mum, by all means, go and have a conversation with your mum, you know, and, and explain what you've heard today, um, what you've learned. And then what your mum can do is book a, a free 10 minute um inquiry call with me through plantbasedhealthonline.com so that's what that would be my suggestion yes i think it is important for people who want actually to change their life uh, uh, to kind of take that first step isn't it and that first yeah. step is actually you know getting the uh, taking the uh, phone and making that phone call so yes i totally agree and you already mentioned that so where can people find you you mentioned plantbasedhealthonline.com where else yes um on facebook i'm also on plant-based health online and on instagram i am jenny fernandez underscore coach 
That is lovely. Let's have a look at some of the questions people have written. Linda says, Linda Curtis, yes, health coaches are needed more than ever. I agree, obviously we agree. And uh, Janet is asking, there are a lot of courses out there. What qualifications, do you need any prior qualifications before you do a course? So I think that could depend from course to course, but what I would definitely do is look for something um, supported by ICF, the International Coach Federation. I trained with a company who were uh, accredited with the ICF, so that, that does give you um, some standard. And there is also there is the UK Health Coaching Association. So you can you can look there and you can you can get some more information about accredited courses. The course that I did um, was a six month course, but you had up to a year in which to complete it because I know there are coaching courses that are weekend courses that are out there. But, you know, there, there's a lot to learn. And, and the other thing I would recommend is that you look for a course that gives you plenty of opportunities to practice because it's one one thing to learn the theory, but um, you really, really do need to practice and get used to having the sort of coaching conversations and asking, you know, open questions and and not feeling embarrassed to delve a bit deeper because sometimes you, you know, you might feel that you're crossing a line, but actually it is your job to delve deeper, obviously sensitively, um, but that that's what you need to do. So yeah, look up those associations. Thank you, Jenny. And Jane has written that uh, she's thanking, she's saying it's very inspiring and motivational. She's drinking water and walking more. Well done. Yeah. And she wants to implement more healthy vegan foods. You know, you could actually have a look at the website of Plant Based Health Professionals UK. We have a few recipes, not a lot, but they are healthy. And also, if you haven't, you can sign up to the 21 day Plant Based Health Challenge. Again, you can find the link on the Plant Based Health Professionals UK uh, you know, website. And, you know, even if you don't follow all the emails, the, the, I think it is the second or third email has an ebook with recipes. <laughs> so you can get a lot of nice new recipes to try. So I shouldn't really say that. You should actually obviously get all the emails and not <laughs> unsubscribe. But, you know, there is a nice ebook attached to it. So I would really recommend it. And that's it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? No, I think that's it. It was really lovely talking to you, Jenny. Yeah, you I too, really Leila. Thank you. And uh, that is actually the end of our part one. Uh, obviously, we have two more talks, um, you know, kind of uh, planned. And I'm looking forward to the next one, which is raw vegan diet, because I don't know much about it. And so I, I really want to, I'm looking forward to that one. But it's actually a separate link on, uh, you know, on the website and on the Facebook uh, page. So make sure that you go and, you know, you can you sign off. I mean, this is going to finish anyway. Uh, make sure that you move to the other link at uh, 4.30. All right, then. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. See you hopefully at 4.30. Bye-bye.